Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another uh, colloquium by the <coughs> Severo Ochoa program here in uh, Granada at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Lorena Acuña, and she will talk about the transitional between super Earth and sub Neptunes, interior and atmospheres modeling of the low mass planet's population. So Lorena will be properly introduced by Anchon, our director. Anchon, please. Okay, good morning to everybody. Um, it, welcome to our seminar program, the Severo Chua seminar program. Our today's speaker is Lorena Cunha. She is currently working at the Max Planck Institute of Astronomy in Germany. Previously, she did, she did her PhD in France uh, at the LAM laboratory. Her research focuses on the internal structures and, and atmospheres of exoplanets, where she has developed modeling tools to interpret mass, radius, and atmospheric data from missions and telescopes such as TESS, KIOPS, ESPRESSO, and JWST. During her PhD, she developed the MSA, that is the, the so-called MAXA Super Earth Interior Model, which is a self-consistent interior atmosphere model applicable to super Earth and subnations. She has also worked on observational data to obtain the bulk composition of and interior conditions of low mass planets, including the systems, the well-known systems such as TRAPPIST-1, LHS 1140, and K2-138, and the assessment of observability of Earth-sized planets such as TRAPPIST-1c and 55 Cancri e Today she will talk about she will talk us about the transition between super Earths and subnations, interior and atmosphere modeling of the low mass planet population. Thanks a lot for coming here, Lorena, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, and also thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to present this work. Um, so as you can see by the title, I was going to focus only on low mass planets. But the last five to 10 minutes, I'm going also to present a sneak peek of what I'm doing right now in Math Planck Institute about gas ions too. So the exoplanet population is very diverse, far more diverse than we could have thought, but just looking at the solar system planets. And to show that, I'm showing here the plot of planet mass versus orbital distance, which is also a proxy of the equilibrium temperature of planets or how irradiated they are. And by low mass planets, that is the first part of this talk I'm going to be focusing on, uh, we mean planets that have masses between around half or a third of Earth mass up to more or less the mass of Neptune, which is around 15 times, 17 times the, the mass of the Earth. As you can see here, it's color coded according to the detection method of the exoplanet. And most of the data that, that I have analyzed, that essentially the mass and the radius of exoplanets has been provided by Doppler, also known as radial velocity, by transit photometry, and also in some cases by timing, which is timing transit variations. Um, inside the low mass planet population, we have several types of planets. I will talk about some of them, particularly compact multiplanetary systems and water walls. But let's see how, like, what would you know about their composition so far? So here, what I'm showing is a histogram of the radii of the exoplanets that were detected by Kepler, which was a NASA mission that used transit photometry for the detection, and now is decommissioned. So you can see two peaks, and there's been a lot of work uh, looking into this, if it's really an observational bias of a physical uh, effect. And uh, what, what they obtained in Fulton et al. was that these two subpopulations that we see in the radius with a valley in between is because of the composition of low mass planets. In particular, we have super Earths at 1.3 S radii and uh, at 2.4 S radii, we have some Neptunes. What we know about their composition is that super Earths are dominated by silicates and iron, whereas uh, sub Neptunes are volatile rich. Now, in general lines, uh, we still have some questions that are more fine. Uh, in the case of super Earths, the question is whether they present an atmosphere that is thin and has no hydrogen helium, but rather CO2 or oxygen, or if they are bare rocks without an atmosphere. In the case of some Neptunes, 
Um, the question is whether they have hydrogen and helium or water or a combination of both. And if it's two end members, it's more like a spectrum between both. So in order to answer these questions during my PhD, I use interior models, which is one of the approaches that we can take. So how do we normally use interior models? So when we first discover an exoplanet, we have their mass and their radius characterized, and we want to know what this composition is. So what we do is plot it together with a mass radius diagram, as the one you can see there on the left. Um, so in this case, you can see that there are several lines that have color uh, that indicates that the composition is constant and the radius increases as the mass increases for the same composition. There are different assumptions in interior models. Um, we can even consider, for example, the volatile that dominates uh, their layers, for example, hydrogen, helium versus water, as I mentioned before, or even for the same component, we can consider different phases. Is, for example, is water in an ice form, in a liquid form, or a gaseous form? And just like atmospheric models and other uh, observational techniques, they are the inertias. In particular, the inertia here will be for the same mass and radius, serial compositions match the observed uh, density of one planet. So this is an example for 55 concrete E, which is a well-known super Earth, uh, where we can fit its mass and radius with 100% mantle composition, which is just rock, no iron and no volatiles. And also we can fit it with another composition that includes a little bit of iron, particularly 32%, which is the core mass fraction of the Earth, and a little bit of water, SLU stands for supercritical water. So how do interior models work? So here we have a diagram for Marseille's interior model for super Earths. So we take as input the mass of the planet and two compositional parameters, which are the core mass fraction and the water mass fraction. And these are the masses of these two layers divided by the total mass of the planet, respectively. And then the other input is the surface pressure and temperature I will come back to the surface pressure and temperature, which are the boundary conditions on the interior model, and uh, explain how we can collate them self-consistently. Now, the interior model takes this input and along a one-dimensional grid that represents the radius of the planet from the center up to the top of the last layer, we solve a set of differential equations. These differential equations uh, take different assumptions. For the pressure, we assume hydrostatic equilibrium, for gravity, it's just Gauss theorem. And then for the temperature, we assume that the driving mechanism of heat transport is convection, and therefore the uh, profile is an adiabatic profile. And then finally, the last equation for density is not a differential equation, but it's rather the equation of a state, uh, which is obtained from laboratory experiments and also quantum theory simulations for the different materials, uh, in this case, water, rock, and iron. And then finally, uh, after solving this, uh, we obtain as output the radius of the planet and the iron to sequel mole ratio. Now the iron to sequel mole ratio, since most of the iron is found in the core and most of the silicates are in the mantle, is a proxy of the uh, core to mantle ratio. But, and it's usually used to constrain the genesis between the core and the water mass fraction, and it's obtained from the abundances of the star. So let's go back to the surface pressure and temperature. Many of the plants that we characterize and discover today are highly irradiated. And as you can see here in this diagram, when I started my PhD in 2019, the assumption was that water was in liquid phase, uh, but we wanted to make this applicable to highly irradiated planets. So it needs some adaptations to take into account changes in temperature due to high radiations. So particularly what I did was use an atmospheric model to calculate the surface temperature. So I'll go back uh, to that again to explain the processes that define the atmosphere, the temperature. But for a moment, I'm going to explain how the interior and the atmosphere are coupled. So if we have a planet whose water layer is massive, what we do is fix the interior and atmosphere interface at a fixed pressure, which is 300 bars. So you can see here that this is not really the physical 
interface between the mantle and the water layer, but just a physical uh, and physical or a theory uh, uh, interface between high pressures and low pressures of water. And here we are indicating it at a pressure temperature uh, plot, which is the water phase diagram. And the red last line indicates this uh, interface. So for pressures higher than this line, the ideal is calculated by an interior model. And for pressures below that, we are going upwards the planet and that is calculated by the atmospheric model. Now for planets whose surface pressure is less than this pressure of 300 bars, what we have is that the interface between the interior and the atmosphere is the physical surface between the mantle and the water layer. And in this case, uh, they model uh, surfaces, for example, of one bar, two bars, up to 300 bars. Now, how does the atmospheric model work? So we take as input the surface pressure and temperature, uh, the composition of the atmosphere, and to make it consistent, we take a water-dominated um, composition. In this case, it's 99% water and 1% CO2. And we also take as input the mass and radius of the planet from the center up to uh, the top of the last interior layer, which is the bottom of the atmosphere. And with this, we um, prescribe a pressure temperature profile along the um, atmosphere of the planet. So the thermal structure is a near surface layer where convection occurs, but it's too hot for clouds to condense, so there's no condensation. And then the, the following layer, uh, now the temperature is low enough that condensation and convection happen at the same time. And then finally, we have a mesosphere uh, that is a radiative layer with an isothermal profile. And this is a model after uh, models of the solar system, particularly for Venus. So after taking all of this, what we do is solve the radiative transfer equation. So this equation, what it does is just govern how heat is redistributed along the uh, atmosphere. Uh, it takes into account also the opacity of the uh, different species. So you can see that the atmosphere is divided in several layers, and in each layer the um, heat is computed. So what we are interested in obtaining from the atmospheric model is the emitted radiation um, at the top, and also the absorbed radiation of the top of the atmosphere. Now, we do that by calculating two quantities that atmospheric models know as orcoin lower radiation and the bond albedo. The OLR, the orcoin lower radiation, it's the um, emission spectrum of the planet integrated over wetlands. So that is the volumetric emission. Whereas the bond albedo is the percentage of the light that the planet reflects back uh, when it receives the light from the star. So an albedo of one means that it reflects everything it receives from the star, whereas an albedo of two means that it absorbs everything. And also we, we obtain the atmospheric thickness and mass. That is not that done with radiative transfer, but instead by integrating the same equation for gravity uh, that we were doing for interior mode. So uh, once we obtain the going long radiation and the bond video. Uh, what we do is impose radiative convective equilibrium. That means that everything that comes out of the atmosphere, the OLR, must be equal to everything that is absorbed. And what is absorbed, the absorbed flux, is calculated by using the bonal video. That is what we needed in the first place. It's also calculated with the star and the planet parameters, particularly the radius, the effective temperature of the star, as well as the distance between the planet and the star, the same year axis. So we calculate with the atmospheric model, uh, the absorbed flux and the emitted flux for different surface temperatures, as you can see there on the plot for three planets, Travis 1, B, C, and D. And uh, we use a root finding method that finds the, um, the surface temperature at which uh, both are equal. As you can see here, for example, for Travis 1, B, and C, that is around 2,000 to 2,500 Kelvin. And then we iterate this step within the interior model so that we converge radius and surface temperature or boundary temperature um, in the forward model. Okay. So once we have the forward model, the complete interior atmospheric coupling, 
if you remember the input that we were using for the interior and the atmosphere, the inputs are not directly the things that we can observe that are the observables. These are the mass, the radius, and if available, the iron to the cold abundances. Um, so in reality, what we want is to have as input the observables and as output the, the non-observables, which is the composition of the band, the composition of parameters. So what we need to do is use a retrieval method. So during my PhD, I focus on Markov, Ten Monte Carlo, MCMC, but there are also other alternatives like nested sampling, machine learning. And that is something that I would like to support in the future. Now, the uh, benefits of using a retrieval method are it, they, it allows to explore the parameter space, especially when there are strong degeneracies. And also, we obtain the uncertainties of the non observable parameter uh, given the uncertainties of the observables. And as you can see here on um, the output of the retrieval method, what we obtain is the posterior distribution function, which is the statistical distribution of the non-observables. Okay, so I just explained the whole methodology, so to say, and now I'm going to present the results. I have divided the results in two sets, so to say, and this is the first set, which is the interior composition of planets in multiplanetary systems. So multiplanetary systems are uh, pla uh, systems where the host star has several planets orbiting it. Um, why are we interested in studying its composition? Well, because if there are compositional differences between the planets in the same system, it means that these differences are due to, uh, for example, location in the same proprietary disk or local differences, uh, since all the planets form from the same nebula, so to say. Um, so what we do is apply this whole retrieval uh, framework to calculate the composition in serial systems. Um, that has been done before, or they tried to do it in Leleo et al. But the problem of using density in sort of an interior model is that density is not only dependent on the composition of the planet, but also on the mass and the radiation. And you, you need to use an interior model to decouple all these effects and really get to the root of the composition. So what we do is select systems with only low mass planets, less than 20 Earth masses, and systems with five or more planets. And the final sample includes six systems, um, which include the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is well known for hosting seven planets around an M dwarf, and uh, also K238, which is also a piece in a pod. So systems that are very close to each other following each other, and um, they have very similar sizes, but in contrast, the one, one with the other is that TRAPPIST-1 is more of a rocky terrestrial planet, whereas uh, the K238 systems are mostly sub-Neptunes. So it's interesting to compare both types. Okay, so let's start with TRAPPIST-1. Uh, we find that the innermost planets have no atmosphere, or if there's an atmosphere, it's very thin. I will go back later to this because at the time, in 2021 and 2022, we didn't have atmospheric data yet, but we will now. Um, here I'm showing the water mass fraction, so the percentage of water the planet has as a function of irradiation temperature, which is the equilibrium temperature considering now below zero. Uh, let's move to planet D. Planet D is quite tricky because it's at the very edge of the habitable zone, and depending on the atmospheric model that you use, uh, and the species that you consider, and if the model is 1D or 3D, you can obtain that it, in the surface, the planet could have liquid water or gaseous water. So to explore all possibilities, what we do is obtain the water mass fraction uh, with the liquid water, and uh, also with, so consider that water is made as a gas in a uh, atmosphere with a background gas that is nitrogen and CO2. From 3D, 3D models, uh, TRAPPIST-1D could be unlikely to have uh, liquid water, although there's been a paper like a week ago uh, by the French group in uh, Tourbet et al. that says that maybe it could have liquid water. So there's a little bit of controversy there, but if we assume that it's not liquid water, it has very little amount of volatiles. And then finally, we go to the outer part of the system, which do have a non-negligible amount of water, 
uh, compared to the inner parts of the system. And what we see that is interesting is that the water mass fraction increases with distance from the star. And I'll explain later why that is interesting for, for the point of view of plant evolution. Now here I'm changing, I'm changing a little bit how I'm presenting the data. So we still have the water mass fraction, but now instead of reducing the replication temperature, I'm taking the flux we see uh, from the start at the top of the atmosphere, and I normalize it to the flux of the innermost planet so that all systems have their innermost planet falling at one, and therefore it's easier to compare system to system. So this is TRAPPIST-1, as you, we can still see that increase of uh, water mass fraction for the outer planets. Well, let's add K-138. And as expected, there were sub-Neptunes. Um, we see higher water mass fractions compared to TRAPPIST-1. But what is interesting to see is that we see an increase of water mass fraction as well. Uh, and even the outer planet not only could have water, but could have hydrogen and helium. Now let's add the other systems that we analyzed. We see a diversity of water mass fractions, uh, but we do see in common for all systems is that the inner planets tend to be dry and the outer planets tend to be water rich, either with water or hydrogen helium. Uh, now, how do we tell the difference between planets that could have water only or planets that could have hydrogen helium mixed with water? So what we do is select those planets that uh, have their radius that is observed, the observational data, the radius is higher than a water planet model can reproduce. So that means that the assumptions that we are taking into the interior model are not applicable to these planets that are marked here with empty markers. Uh, so the assumptions that we need to revisit are either because we have hydrogen helium in the atmosphere, or we have an atmosphere that is not in hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, what could be driving uh, the atmosphere out of hydrostatic equilibrium? That is atmospheric escape. So what we do is estimate um, the amount of envelope that the planet could lose due to atmospheric escape, uh, Gins escape and SUV uh, escape. So Gins escape is uh, produced by the fact that the bulk of the planet, the core, is not massive enough to produce a radiation output to hold on to the atmosphere. Whereas XUV uh, photo evaporation is produced by the high radiation, especially in the XUV uh, produced by the star. And that extra energy that is uh, warming up the upper parts of the atmosphere is blowing all those atoms away. So here what I'm showing is a table where we have the core mass fraction, the water mass fraction for each planet in the systems. And the third column is a metric that quantifies the difference between the radius calculated with a pure water uh, planet and the observed radius. And it's expressed in sigma, so it's the difference divided by the uncertainty of the planet. So those planets that have uh, a difference larger than one sigma are good candidates for having either, either hydrogen helium or uh, atmospheric escape. And then in the last column, what I'm showing is the mass lost due to genes escape uh, for hydrogen uh, in units of Earth mass. So what we do is take those planets that have high difference between the two significantly, and those that do have hydrogen helium atmospheres, um, they have high differences, but no genes escape, whereas those that are losing their atmosphere have both. They have high difference and a significant amount of envelope lost. And I am marking them here in green and uh, orange respectively. Now let's talk about uh, plant formation and evolution. Why could be shaping the trend that we saw before um, for Keitra and Entertain, Trappist one, and in general, the dichotomy between inner dry planets and outer volatile rich planets? Well. Uh, this will be the formation, the location of the uh, water ice line, uh, where pebbles rich in ice are uh, accreted by the planet, and then these planets move inwards. Uh, in some cases, we can even see an increase of water mass fraction within the inner part of the system, and that could also be shaped by atmospheric escape. 
that could be XUV or also um, core power mass loss. And then finally, for the rocky inner planets, the fact that they don't have water as well could be shaped by the by the fact that they form uh, close to the refractory iron and silicon uh, lines. So in these lines, um, rock and iron are condensing and pebbles are rich in these uh, materials and they are available for accretion where the planet forms. So this is a summary slide for this set of results. We conducted an analysis with a, a homogeneous, and that means that we use the same interior model with the same assumptions. And we see a dichotomy between, between inner dry planets and outer water rich planets in multiplanetary systems. And this could be shaped by planet formation and evolution, particularly uh, formation uh, close to the refractory and ice lines, and also atmospheric escape, particularly Gibbs escape. Then if you want to have like um, um, a general idea of how water rich these planets are, the inner planets are always less than 5% water or volatiles. Then for the more moderate volatile rich sub Neptunes, uh, their water mass fractions are around 10 to 25%. And then what we propose is that for planets whose water mass fraction with our interior model have more than 30%, those are good candidates for having higher mass helium. Now, the second set of results uh, is focusing more of atmospheric characterization and how we can use James Webb to, to characterize rocky planets. So there are three main uh, methods uh, to characterize observationally a transiting system. You have transmission spectroscopy, phase curves, and emission spectroscopy. The one I'm going to be focusing on is emission spectroscopy or photometry. So the way it works is the planet has a secondary eclipse. It passes behind the star and then it, we can see the star and the planet together. And when the planet is behind the star, the star is blocking everything that the planet reflects and emits all that flux, all that radiation. So by doing a differential measurements on the flux between uh, when the planet is behind the star and after it has uh, finish, finished the eclipse, we can obtain the emitted flux of the planet. And then we can, if we have an spectrometer, we can bin that in wavelengths and obtain the emission spectrum. Now, do you remember what I defined the OLR, the Orgoidium of Retardation, that our atmospheric model calculated as the integrated emission spectrum? So that means that internally, our atmospheric model calculates the emission spectrum to determine radiative convective equilibrium. So we are going to use that together with the interior model um, calculations to, um, to see how the emission spectrum looks for different uh, scenarios. Also, emission spectrum is sensitive to the chemical composition and the temperature profile is very valuable information about the atmosphere. So um, what we want to answer, the question that we want to answer with James Webb is, do we rocks a uh, planet, so no atmosphere, and Venus-like atmospheres look the same in emission? And what we do is, run the trap uh, interior modeling. In this case, I'm using TRAPPIST-1. Um, and then we obtain the posterior distribution function of the surface pressure. And what we do is sample that distribution and calculate emission spectra of how the atmosphere will look like at different surface pressures and different uh, pressure temperature profiles. And then we use um, the um, noise generator and observation generator of James Webb, which is Pandexo to calculate the uncertainties and see if we can differentiate one scenario from the other. So these are the results. There's a lot to unpack here. So let's go with planet B in this one. Uh, this is work done by Green et al. and E et al. And what they find is that the emission is too high to be explained with a Venus-like atmosphere, even any atmosphere. So they discard um, any atmosphere presence and they say that planet B is a very rock. And I'll, I will explain later why that is so interesting. Now for planet C, what we obtain from the interior models is that uh, from the posterior distribution that I showed before, the one sigma uh, for the surface pressure is between zero and 80 bars. So you can have either um, anything between having no atmosphere or a maximum of 80 bars. 
For reference, the atmosphere of Venus is 92 bars. So it will be less massive, slightly less massive than uh, Venus atmosphere. Now, after I submitted my paper and did the interior modeling, Siva et al. Uh, and started the analysis from James Webb data. And what they obtained is what you can see here from Minkowski et al. with more detailed uh, models for the atmosphere. Uh, they find that the emission is too high to be explained with a Venus-like atmosphere. So a thick CO2 atmosphere is discarded. However, it's not high enough to say for with centered certainty that there is no atmosphere at all. So we still have a scenarios where we could have an atmosphere that is very thin that has O2 and nitrogen. And what is interesting to see too is that the surface pressure done with interior models with no atmospheric um, uh, data and the final atmospheric data constraint, they are very similar. They agree well with each other between the zero and 80 bars and less than 20 bars. And that's a good sign that we can use interior models to prepare for proposals uh, to observe rocky planets and determine whether they have atmospheres or not. Now, I'm going back to TRAPPIST-1b and explain why its results are interesting, even for interior modeling. So as I explained before, rocky planets have a generosity between iron and water content in their interior. And here I'm showing the estimates of core mass fractions, so the amount of iron the planet has, uh, for trap is one under two scenarios. One where we use just mass and radius data, and the other one where we have mass radius and also the iron to silicon mole ratio calculated from the abundances of the star. And you can see here a diagram where I'm showing the color ones, the scenario one ones, um, together with a scenario two, which is between 20 and 30% uh, iron. And what we like to do here, since the um, the estimates for individual planets is very wow. extent, uh, what we do is, well, from planet formation, we know that the iron to silicon mole ratio should be the same for all planets in the system uh, from uh, formation simulations. So what we do is here in that line, uh, show the overlap of all the uh, iron content of all of the planets. And it's between 23% up to 40%. And here in 32% um, is the Earth. Now, if we know that planet B has no atmosphere, no volatiles at all, what we do in order to is set the uh, water mass fraction to zero and let uh, the core mass fraction as a free parameter so that we can constrain the core mass fraction for the innermost planet. And what we obtain is here in green is the overlap for the previous results, and in pink is the estimate that we have seen for planet D. Now with the degeneracy we saw, thanks to the atmospheric, uh, atmospheric observations. And they all agree pretty well between 23% uh, and 30%, which is also expected because um, the composition of an end dwarf is expected to be less uh, rich in iron and silicates that are sound like a star. Um, that is what the planets have inherited from their host star if, from planet formation. Okay. So here's a summary slide for uh, this set of results. Rocky planets have the inertia between iron and volatile content, but one way of breaking this inertia is to use a combination of interior models with atmospheric characterization, particularly emission photometry and spectroscopy. We cannot use transmission because um, the, if they have atmosphere, their thickness is very uh, small and emission relies heavily on the um, scale height of the atmosphere. So emission is the way to go for this case. So we constrain the surface pressures um, with a combination of interior retrievals and also emission spectra or emission photometry retrievals. And for the case of trappist one c we cannot discard uh, the presence of an atmosphere that is composed by nitrogen and CO2, uh, nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, so we need to follow up on that. Um, and there have been a, a few uh, proposals submitted. That hopefully, fingers crossed, they will be accepted. Now, the last 10 minutes, I'd like to talk about what I've been working on uh, as a postdoc in Max Planck. And I'm going to be talking about exo particularly. 
So here we have the plot that I showed at the very beginning. Um, I talk about low mass planets. Now, what about planets that have higher masses? So in this part of the talk, I'm going to focus on warm gas giants. So these have masses between the mass of Neptune and around 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And um, we are warm regions in contrast with hot Jupiters. They have a clean room temperatures less than a thousand Kelvin. Why? Because we, uh, at that temperature, we start, uh, start having a mechanism that is called the hot Jupiter inflation mechanism. Uh, it's a mechanism that we don't have, we haven't constrained yet, but it inflates hot Jupiters more than a pure hydrogen helium planet. But on the other hand, warm questions, they don't have this mechanism yet, so it uh, eliminates the genesis in their interior modeling. So I'm using a similar um, diagram to show the uh, model for uh, the interiors of gas giants. In this case, we name it Gasly the gas giant mold for interiors. And we are working on a logo, but so far I'm I'm sticking to the um, ghost emoji. It will be ghost theme and exoplanet theme. So similarly to the interior mold for low mass planets, we have the input as mass, the surface pressure and temperature, and also two compositional parameters. But in this case, these are the core mass fraction and the envelope metal mass fraction. So we have a core that is made of rock and water, and then the envelope has hydrogen mixed with water to represent metals and different proportions that are a free parameter for the interior model. Now as output, what we obtain uh, are new parameters. Uh, these are the radius as before. The new parameters are the entropy and the love number. Now, how do these modular parameters translate for um, observables? So the entropy, is represented by internal temperature and age. And the love number, essentially, it, it defines the planetary shape. So planets that uh, have tides or rotate very fast, they are deformed, they are not perfect spheres. And this, the uh, extent of the formation, more of an ellipse than a sphere, gives information about their interior structure. So here I'm showing preliminary results uh, for uh, our interior model for gas giants. So what I did was compute mass radius relationships for Jupiter analogs, same irradiation, atmospheric composition, and age as Jupiter, and compare it with MESA, which is a widely used interior model for stars. But it has been adapted by Müller and Helle um, to, to gas giants, because at the moment we don't have any open source uh, gas in interior model. So um, what we observe is that MESA for a Jupiter analog, analog it um, underestimates the radius of Jupiter by 3%. And we wonder why is this happening? So I, I ran several experiments and what I did was remove the atmosphere from our model, Gasly. And what we find is that MESA does not take into account that, that last bit of the uh, atmosphere, particularly from uh, a thousand bars up to 20 millibars, and that has a non negligible effect on the total radius of the planet. Now, if you go to lower uh, masses up to around the mass of Neptune, uh, we see even a greater difference. That is around, around 10%, 11%. And that is larger because there's two effects here. The one I just talked about before, the atmospheric thickness, but also the calculation of the boundary temperature is simplified uh, with a great model instead of a full physics model that we use uh, for Gasly, uh, which is Petrit Rotrans uh, by Molière et al. And it's also open source and publicly available. So my take home message um, about the gas giant interior model is that Gasly uh, will be open source. So it can be used to prepare uh, uh, proposals, for example, for this web or for any other observations. And it's far more flexible and computationally faster alternative to other publicly available uh, models like MESA. Now, I'm very excited to talk about James Webb that is opening um, an opportunity to characterize this uh, population or subpopulation of exoplanets by providing unprecedented precision in emission and transmission spectra, as well as upcoming observables like the shape of the planet.
And it will, Gasly will definitely be a useful tool to interpret all this data. I think I have three minutes around that. So the last slide, I'd like to talk about what we're excited about for the future. So I talk about plant shape for war museums, emission transmission, and also emission of hot Jupiters. That is the present with James Webb. Now the future is right. We have plateau detection of Earth analogs, exactly the size, distance, and solar type uh, for exoplanets. And Ariel, which we will support a lot of the uh, observations that James Webb is doing now, particularly large survey for sub-Neptunes, and also try to obtain a very large sample to derive the properties of sub-Neptunes like clouds and disequilibrium chemistry. And of course, in the 2030s, 2040s, so that's 10 to 30 years away from this, uh, from now, uh, will be the potential detection of biosignatures via direct imaging either by Havex, Lua, or Live. So thanks so much for your attention and I'll take questions from now. Thanks, so, Professor Paul. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lorena, for coming here and uh, give this very nice talk. And uh, I think it's time for some questions. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very, very nice talk. Um, I have a brief question regarding one of, the, one of your last points uh, about the planet shape. Uh, yeah. I did not get, uh, yeah. let's say, the scale. So mm -hmm. how different has, you know, that shape has to be for me to actually observe the spectral difference? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, we did that calculation for a proposal, yeah. So, um, it depends on the planet, but for example, one particular planet we are doing, we propose observations. The difference has to be around the formation that we observe Jupiter. So that is a 10% difference between the radius on the um, polar radius and the radius on the equator. And also you have to have a good signal to noise. Uh, so you, you do that by having a higher, like a good number of transits that you stack together and yes. So essentially, you mean that uh, the temperature difference and the uh, concentration difference in between those regions uh, is going to change, you know, the spectrum uh, contribution of those things is going to change so much because uh, you mean. Oh, oh, okay. Um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't have the time to explain this. So the planetary shape, you get it, you can do it either by radial velocity or transit. And here we are doing it with transit. So what you could do is get the ingress at the egress of the transit and that defines that is that depends on the planetary shape and you get it for a transit and then alternatively what you can do is bin that and also get the spectrum what that is what we do get both at the same time so you separate those you yeah. combine for a final spectrum you combine with different contributions so the shape is actually going to change those little big contributions the, the, the shape is the same in all wavelengths so yeah, if then if you divide it in wavelengths, you have the spectrum. Yeah. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the first question, I, I, maybe I missed it, but I didn't understand. So when you calculate the uh, the uh, TP structure of the atmosphere, um, where do you get the um, so there is this uh, radiation equilibrium that you uh, that you conserve? The question is for rocky planets. Uh, do you take into account the uh, interior flux of the planet? How do you know it? Hmm. So there are some interior models that do calculate thermal evolution of rocky planets. Most of that comes from um, the the uh, decay of radioactive from the iron. Here we don't consider it because I actually calculated for practice one D here. Yes. Yeah, so basically so, they should, should not be zero, they should be like it's not zero, it's 0 0.15 bats per square meter, if I remember correctly. So here this little bit jump between the dark line in blue and the solid line in blue, the 16 bats per square meter compared to 0 0.15 bats per square meter. So it doesn't change. So basically, uh, what you're saying is that for strongly irrigated planets, you ignore. For a planet such as Trappist 1D, 
is negligible for these calculations of interior modeling. Yeah. Right. Well, in, in, in principle, I mean, it, it should be taken into account, right? I mean, if, if it's not, a, no, if, if it model should be there, for instance, there is no way you can which planet a Jupiter. If you model yeah, you bet. So there are very different planets. Yes, Jupiter. We are doing these calculations. So actually, I have. So they are very different planets. <laughs> so I'm doing these calculations here. Thermal evolution right here. This is the internal temperature. So that's a hit. And this is the age. And this is the thermal curve of Jupiter. So for gas giants, yes, we are calculating it because it's not negligible because you have intrinsic temperatures around 160 and even higher, as you can see, if you go to younger planets. But for rocky planets, as I said, compared 0 0.16 watts per square meter is pretty low. It does not change your relative, trans uh, relative convective. Right. So then the second question. Yeah. How, when, when you do the, uh, the new couple atmospheric uh, profile with the uh, uh, interior profile. So, you to cal to calculate to calculate the atmospheric profile, you need to know boundaries. Yeah. So where do they come from? Uh, it's all models. So the idea is to take the models, get the abundances as three parameters, and then do retrievals in atmospheres and interiors. But, okay. but if, you, if you talk about rocket plants, you do not know, or do you model the outgassing actually? I'm not modeling out gassing. So how do you know what was your composition of that? So here's the thing. In rocky planets, what we need is the density of the atmosphere. And where you have water, CO2, nitrogen, O2, the density of all this is very similar. So it does not change for interior models. Of course, if you have atmospheric data, it does affect the, the species, as I showed for Trappist 1c. But for interior model, and this is a test we did, uh, we consider CO2 dominated atmospheres, water dominated atmospheres, and since their density is very similar, it does not change um, the results. So you're saying that you change the PT profile in the atmosphere? Okay. It does change the PT profile if you take radiative transfer into account, but the density that is the retrieval that That's we do. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. If you have atmospheric data, then yes. But if you have just mass and radius data, no, it doesn't make a difference. And maybe just a comment about NISA code. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I guess I remember there was an option to actually increase the sampling of layers uh, um, and to sample the atmosphere more accurately. Yes, yes. And if you do it, then suddenly you, you get everything right. Yeah, but the problem with that is that MESA only has convective layers. No radiative layers because you need radiative transfer. So you need to couple it with an atmospheric model anyway. No, but I think I think you can add radiative layers if you assume you force the NISA to calculate like gray radiative from two layers. Yeah, but I don't want to do gray. I want to do a retrieval with atmospheric modeling in the future. All right. And atmospheric data and for that I cannot use a gray model because I need the dependence of the opacity and wavelength. So yes, yes, yeah. you're right. But <laughs> thinking of the future, we need more um, you know. Um, wavelength dependent models like K correlated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I am curious about the equation as a state that relate depression, temperature, and density mm -hmm. for the case of water, I, and I. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about uh, this equation? Could be to dependence and do this equation deviate so much from the idea it was your obvious thing. It is yeah. It is yeah. So um so we have water for example. There are several equations of the state and they are when you get into I'm gonna show the water phase that I'm sorry for changing my slides so fast. Here this one. So when you're on this part of the water phase diagram at very low pressures, an ideal gas for water or any other gases is applicable because it is um, the conditions that the ideal gas associates work. But then when you go higher in pressure, you start having super difficult phase and the behavior of water changes a lot. And it happens the same with hydrogen, uh, where you start having metallic hydrogen at very high pressure. So you cannot use uh, an ideal gas. Uh, assumption. Then for iron, um, 
And we're using them all is Vinet equations, which is like a theoretical framework. And then we use data from geological experiments. And also that she, that, is, that is not an idea that's a uh, solid, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a comparison <laughs> of all of them. Well, yeah. Uh, so thank you for the for the talk, first of all. Uh, I, I was wondering, you talked a couple of times about the MCMC during the, mm -hmm. the presentation, and you said that obviously you have to do some sort of a prior to your, your presentation. Yeah. And you said that you are taking uh, radius and masses as your observables, but sometimes, as far as I know, you can actually obtain the radius and masses, and masses with, with MCMC as well. So where these masses and radius come from exactly? So the masses come from um, radial velocity and transit time uh, variations, for the case of Trappist one. And the radius is, uh, transit photometry. And then in that data, if you have the transit and you have many models that can calculate the depth, then you calculate MCMC. But you can see that it's the same statistical method, but applied to a different problem. One to fit the data of the transit, and then we get that from, um, from the final analysis. And then we use that into the retrieval of the interior. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was wondering, because if you take the, the radius uh, as an exterior, is your thing. Uh, yeah, yes, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, you mean using the posterior of the transit photometry analysis as my prior? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they are normally very Gaussian unless there's some problem with the transit photometry data. So what we do is um, since <laughs> what we do is just use uniform priors for recomposition. And then see if the the posterior of the radius from our analysis looks like the posterior of the um of the transit photometry data. Yes, and actually there's a whole discussion on my thesis on what is the best priors uh, for this type of analysis. Yes. Thank you. Someone else. My idea. I have <laughs> another one question regarding to Kepler eleven. As far as I know, it's a very compact uh, planetary system. Kevin, I guess there six or seven planets inside a this was new point of UK. Could you could you believe that this very compact configuration uh, affect the atmospheres or the each planets so, like, you mean like the, the piece in a pod one after the other very closely, you could have the atmospheres. Um yeah, it definitely has an effect on the amount of volatiles uh, because, as I said before, the configuration here is that the planets form beyond the water ice line or where you have pebbles rich in volatiles for accretion and they migrate inwards. And that is what yields the um, mean motion resonances one after the other very closely. And yeah, I would expect that one after the other, they have larger atmospheres and therefore bigger like more massive envelopes yes and then you, if you have xcv for the evaporation um you could expect some erasing of this effect but we don't observe that what because otherwise we would not observe this dichotomy because it would blow up all the planets at the same time yeah thank you uh, well it's a really impressive stuff how can we cover in the model from the interior, the atmosphere, the scape, different scape, beam scape, and the dynamical scape? So I really have so many, it's just like my lack of knowledge of so many questions, which is really difficult. But maybe I will just try to make you a couple of them. Uh, first, uh, is the, with the water, the, the amount, the magnitude you use of water WMF. So this is the water of the whole planet, so it's just only the solid, it's the solid plus the atmosphere all together. It's, yeah, it's all, all of it. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So the water mass fraction is the mass of the layer that you see in light blue. There is the, the high pressure in the interior model, as well as the mass of the atmosphere. So what we do is calculate the interior, let the model converge, 
compared to the cool coupling system, and then obtain at the very end the mass of the atmosphere and recalculate the water mass fraction of mass of the upper layer and the mass of the lower layer. Yes. So when you do retrieve that magnitude from certain parameter, you retrieve the whole amount, but you cannot tell it whether it is in the solid or it is in the atmosphere, or can you? Oh uh, yeah, we can differentiate them. Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, like most of it comes from the interior because most of the mass uh, of the atmosphere or the mass of the atmosphere is 10 to the minus three compared to, you know, you have a planet that has a lot of interior uh, water, it's around 20%. So you compare 20% to 10 to the minus three, it's very like the, the, the contribution of the mass um, from the upper atmosphere is very little, but still we include it for consistency. Mm -hmm. Now the radius, the radius, it does have a huge effect, and that is why we include it as well as consistently, so that we have the total radius of the planet is the radius from the center up to the top of the interior layer, uh, plus the thickness of the atmosphere, and we, we calculate both, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the other magnitude is called the core mass fraction. Yeah. What is that? Is it that is, is the... Um, the amount of iron, like the core of the Earth, yeah. divided by the total mass of the planet. So it's a percentage of iron found in the planet. So we would call it the iron... Iron mass fraction, mass yeah. Fraction? <laughs> oh, right. Okay, yeah, yes. just make sure because... Yes, <laughs> yeah. Like I said before, most of the iron is found in the core, most of the silicates and the mantles, so yes, essentially it's iron mass fraction, yeah. Right. Um, uh, in one of the points you mentioned about the, well, it wasn't clear for me whether the temperature of the atmosphere, the pressure temperature, is an input or is an output because I have seen, I, I think I haven't understood. Can you go back to the slide where you calculate the ready transfer equation? This one? Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the input of what you actually calculate? So the input is surface pressure and temperature. Yeah, so the, then, the points here, this point right here. And then you calculate the profile. Yeah, exactly. I see. But I think as Dennis already mentioned, this really critical depends on yeah. the composition of the atmosphere. Yes. To make it not like Venus or Mars yes. or the Earth. Yes. So I wonder, I mean, how can we simplify it? So um, recent... It doesn't matter for you whether it is Venus or Mars or the Earth. Okay, or... I can explain. Right. Um, so... There are two ways of approaching the calculation of a PT profile. One is to prescribe the, the profile, saying my near surface layer is convective. Next one is convective, but it's a wet convection. And then up, I have a mesosphere. Okay, it takes into account some assumptions that I have to make. It's not self-consistent. And then there's self-consistent PT profiles, like uh, the ones that we are calculating now for the gas giant model. Because as I said before, um, it depends a lot on the opacity species and also the radiation temperatures. Now, the reason that I did this in the PhD is because, like I said before, the composition of your atmosphere, as long as there's there's no hydrogen helium, doesn't change uh, the density because the density of water, CO two, O two, is very similar with each well, other. But well, you actually matter for you just the column of amount of the atmosphere, the weight. Yeah, the weight is defined by the density. That's that really okay. Um, so, so it doesn't matter what PT same, profile I have. But that... you can have a, the same amount with a different, you can have an atmosphere which is more extended or more compressed. They can have both the same mass. So for you, it doesn't really matter the PT profile. Like that. So the it, PT, yeah, so the PT profile. So I, don't, I don't really understand why you are really interested in the PT when actually it doesn't. It really does make, that. okay, it does make a difference if I'm calculating this, but then if I have a PT profile, for example, that is self-consistent and I assume water, CO2, O2, it adds at computational time, cannot do retrievals because it takes too long. And as I said, the density at these phases, when you don't have hydrogen helium, does not make a difference on what we calculate for interior moving. Mm -hmm. That is the atmospheric thickness, the atmospheric radius. So if my atmosphere has no hydrogen helium, 
um, the PT profile, whether it's calculated self consistently or this way does not make a difference. Obviously, if I take like a, a isothermal profile that is very far from the equilibrium temperature applied, that makes a difference. But this, whether it's PT profile self consistent from particular trans or this, um, does not make a difference as long as I don't have hydrogen helium. Those are calculations that I've done myself. I don't have to put here, but I'm sorry you have to read me. Well, sorry, just just close. But it's also true if you are not interested in any radiation, because if if that's not the case, you the, can get any. Uh, there are there are family of temperature profiles that will give you the same equilibrium temperature. But if you are interested in the in the flux, in the amount of flux that is emitted mm -hmm. from from the surface of the planet. You yeah. have to have a realistic PT profile. Yeah, I agree. But when we don't have atmospheric data, it doesn't make a difference in the density. So when you have atmospheric data, like this one, this is why I'm showing more detailed models from Linkowski et al. Because now we are compared with atmospheric data uh, and we want to obtain constraints on this. More than better than interior models, but interior model was needed before to determine whether there's a possibility of, of an atmosphere or not. And then you use a simple, so say, atmospheric model that is not great model, but it's great correlated, and then obtain the atmospheric data and use the more detailed models that are consistent with PT profiles. But using a PT profile for interior modeling does not affect the observables all interior model, which is mass and radius and the density in general. Um, yeah, even though the emission changes, yes, but the mass and radius, they don't change. And I did that test myself, <laughs> okay? But then, yes, when you have atmospheric data, yes, you need to conserve self-consistent PT profiles. But I never said the opposite. So from uh, a measurement like that, we can infer something about the interior of the planet. For the case of planet B, yes, because as I said before, um, we have a generosity between volatile mass fraction and core mass fraction. So with these measurements for plant B, we confirm that we have no atmosphere, therefore no volatiles. So that 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 breaks the generosity. So here, when I do the interior modeling retrievals, I set water mass fraction, volatile mass fraction to zero, and I leave the core mass fraction as a free parameter. So what is the quantity that affect the spectra up through the mass? And then according to the gravity or to the size of the planet? So what we do is I read you on into your model to get the surface pressure here. This is what we obtain. Okay. And this gives you an idea of the surface pressure. And then you say, okay, maximum surface pressure is 80 bars. So you say, okay, I get I take a CO2 atmosphere for the proposal, not for the final atmosphere data, right? And take the um, CO2 dominated atmosphere, a water dominated atmosphere, and no atmosphere, and compare them and see the air bars and see if you can distinguish one from the other and say, this is compatible to all interior modes, but we want to break this inertia. So we propose this and you find out what wavelength is better for your observation. So it's a surface pressure. Okay, I think I have to think a little we, bit. We can discuss about later that. if you want so to. We later on extended discussion. Yeah. So yeah. We can keep um, the discussion and we'll see. If there are any other questions, I think we can close here. There are some, so there is some online questions. Ah, okay. By the way, hang on. So, Guillem, you can open your mic. Uh, hi. I am Guillem Anglada here from here from the IAA. Uh, thank you for this comprehensive talk. And I, I, I would like to know your opinion on the jumbos that the so-called uh, jumbos, which are Jupiter mass binary objects. And because there is a, a recent report by Samuel Pearson and, and collaborators of, of uh, several detections of this, of this uh, supposedly binary um, planetary mass objects in we, using the James Webb telescope. I would like to know your opinion. Do you think uh, this is there are tru truly uh, Jupiter mass objects, or there are probably fake detections, or the 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 properties of these objects can be uh, properly determined in in these kind of observations? So um, 
I'm afraid I'm not familiar with Jumbos. Um, but if I understood your explanation, these are Jupiter-sized planets that are binaries that orbit a binary system. Is that correct? No, no, no. They are uh, like these free, uh, free floating objects. Ah, okay. But they are, interestingly, they are, apparently, they are binaries. So the theory of star formation, uh, I, as far as I know, uh, cannot explain how can you eject it? You can easily, uh, in a wow. hierarchical uh, system, to explain that you have, for example, three objects. The, the lower mass object is ejected because of the interaction. Yeah. Yeah. But how can you eject a binary? So I, 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 I am very curious about that because maybe it's just a, a projection effect. They look at like binaries, or maybe they are not truly. Uh, Jupiter mass objects, and because you know how to obtain the properties of these objects, I am, I am curious of uh, how uh, robust are, are these detections. Um, I'm not familiar with that work, but I do know about floating planets and um, Jupiter mass planet being ejected a little bit. So I know free floating planets, the only parameter that you can get is the mass of the planet, and even if you get the mass, the uncertainty is quite wide. So even within those uncertainties, if you have a Jupiter mass planet, it's compatible with a Jupiter mass planet, could be even more massive, but I would need to see exactly the number. Uh, so that's number one. Um, and then second, even if it's a Jupiter mass planet or a binary with a Jupiter mass planet, um, I think that's quite, as you said, it's quite challenging from planet formation perspective because you need a lot of angular momentum to eject Jupiter mass planet. So if you're interested, I would look at Anders Johansson work, who works on this top, this type of planet formation events, like one planet gets kicked out of the system. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you. I, I am very intrigued about, about this because it's, it's very very hard to understand how you can eject a binary system and, and, and keep them together for for a long time. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, no, I, I suggest you to read this, this interesting uh, Astor PH paper. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have something else in the Zoom? No, so I think we can conclude here. So thank you again to our speaker. Thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, this afternoon, if all of you are invited, we have some.